my name is Frederik Kerling and I am a quantum expert and cybersecurity consultant at Atos. I'm also a member of the expert community and the scientific community. In this short series, I will give you just short snippets of my course, Quantum in Business and Society, and I will teach you something about how you can best market uh, quantum technologies in the market today. As a start off in this first session, we will give a very short look into the history of the market and how our current situation has come to be, why that is. How did it all begin? We all know some line of text that contains the word quantum, whether it is a movie title, a discount slogan, an ad firm or brand name, or just something as simple as a branch in physics. It is a commonly misused term that just sounds cool. If anybody ever refers you a quantum discount, remember that by physics standards that means the smallest possible discount in existence. But where does this hype come from? Why are the companies and organizations all of a sudden gearing for quantum applications? What are they thinking? And how did it all come to be? Understanding these questions will help us understand the market, and with that, our place in it. By now, most people will have seen these kind of messages. Kaspersky's lab once described it as the cryptopocalypse. Over the years, we've progressed, and let me assure you this. Provided you do your work properly in time, quantum technologies will overall greatly improve its security and privacy. That being said, this message is still a prevailing one. It is caused by the hyping of the so-called first quantum market, that of QKD and cybersecurity. The first quantum market began with QKD, short for Quantum Key Distribution, a point-to-point -point super safe key exchange mechanism. At the time, it however faced an impossible market. It was an over-the-top security measure, and not only that, but the cybersecurity market is a market that faces mostly day-to-day -day challenges. A cybersecurity expert worries about tomorrow or next week's challenge and tries to solve yesterday's or previous week's vulnerabilities. That means that they are very hard to convince to invest into a solution that is going to mitigate a problem which is not going to be around for another 10 years. Not only that, but very few applications warrant a security measure as strong as QKD. Additionally, QKD introduced a new paradigm to cybersecurity. Previous years, cryptography and encryption was always considered the strongest chain of cybersecurity. The advent of quantum computers and the fact that, for instance, RSA could be easily broken really shifted that paradigm, and therefore the message QKD gave was very different from what was heard before. Either way, it was successfully marketed, and this marketing caused the first hype, the big, bad quantum computer. Marketing that was mostly directed at fear and investing in QKD was the way to protect yourself from the big, bad quantum computer. But this was only the first wave. The second hype wave starts here. The billions of euros of investment that has poured into quantum hardware development. At this point, I don't know exactly how much was invested, but I'd estimate globally well over 20 billion euros. The second quantum market, also the quantum computing race, is a new land of opportunity which caused the second hype. It is extremely hardware driven. It consists out of many experimentalists and achieved very great successes in a very short time. I remember being in the middle of this when I was finishing my work at the Niels Bohr Institute. It seemed that every week an almost insurmountable threshold was achieved in a very short amount of time. At the time, there was little to no focus on usability, the achievements were made and successes were booked, plenty of investments and no reason yet to worry about application. Additionally, at the time, media also had no idea of the significance of all of these achievements. The field itself ends with so-called quantum supremacy, aka the winner of the quantum computing race, the first person or first organization to create a quantum computer that is faster than any classical computer can ever be. But quantum supremacy by itself is an empty phrase. The reason for that is simple. There are no discernible use cases that become available when achieving quantum supremacy. The finishing line in itself 
does not have any price, functional use cases, and with that, a return on investments are still a long road ahead. This gives the rise of the quantum computing use case market. This is the market where we are currently at. A lack of use cases puts hardware development and developers in a very tough spot. There is no real application for them to show full large investments that they have gathered. Real applications, however, also greatly decide future hardware architectures. For instance, Hamiltonian simulation at the moment is still seeing a rise in qubit size and actual applicability, however, the general gate-based quantum computer is stagnating. Quantum software was relatively ignored for many years, and however now suddenly becomes very powerful, because those market players that have good and functional use cases are becoming equally valuable as those companies that has billions of euros invested in it, simply because these use cases is what make those original investments worthwhile. And this gives rise to the so-called current slash beginning quantum computing use case market. Use cases are worth a lot of money, and those that have them understand this. The third market is only just emerging. It is that of quantum internet. And unlike our other two markets, quantum internet is not yet hyped. It does, however, pose a few challenges we need to understand. The quantum internet is unique in its kind, simply because applications work with only a few qubits meaning that even only one or two or less than 10 qubits being transmitted over a network have usable use cases. Not only are they usable, they are very easily marketable. They're very clear. They also replace existing QKD systems. Where QKD is point-to-point, -point, quantum internet provides end-to-end -end security. They have multiple applications in banking or telecommunications, and they offer very little threats to our current cybersecurity landscape and a lot of opportunities to improve the cybersecurity landscape even further. Not only that, but they provide perfectly anonymous and instant correlations. Now, instant does indeed mean faster than light, but that this does not mean that there is communication faster than light. These correlations might be perfect and instant, but they are, however, still random. The setting up of these correlations, however, costs a lot of time. The field is very promising, but intrinsically very different. It'll take time for people, and especially businesses, to understand just what they can do with these kinds of properties. For me, it is as of yet difficult to predict if and how quantum internet will be hyped, but I'm quite sure that they will come up with something. And then there's a the fourth and final quantum market, the market of quantum natives. Little children and kids and people born and raised with quantum computers at their hands and free to experiment with weird concepts like entanglement, superposition, and instant correlations. It is extremely difficult to predict what this market will bring. Not even the most intelligent Nobel laureates of our time have ever had the opportunity of toying with quantum effects so easily as the quantum natives will do from a day-to-day -day basis. For them, concepts like entanglement, superposition, and instance correlations will come as easily as swiping left or right. And who knows, maybe one day sharing a Schrodinger cat over the internet will mean something completely different than just a simple joke. We've reached the end of our first session. Stay tuned for next, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out via either LinkedIn or Twitter. Stay home, stay safe, 